Well, now finally, I'm going to play the Beethoven Sonata Opus 109, from which we heard the last movement's theme at the beginning of the program. This work, I think, is crucial to a discussion of the variative habit in modern dress, because it's one of those pieces in which we notice that the premises upon which the classical sonata was founded are breaking down, and that the venerable principles of the monolithic motivic treatment, such as Svelink used to build his piece, are returning to music, somewhat disguised perhaps, but returning nonetheless. The second movement of this sonata, for instance, is an example of a structure which looks a great deal like and sounds a great deal like a conventional sonata of the classical period. It has all the appropriate modulatory conventions. It moves from its initial key through to the dominant of that key, and then comes back again and it repossesses the dominant material in the tonic key. And in all of these things, it very much resembles a quite conventional exposition and development and recapitulation from a classical sonata movement. But that's only what it does on the surface. Beneath that surface, it's seething with an energy which has very little to do with the surface form, the borrowed cloak of harmonic propriety which Beethoven puts on for the occasion. Underneath, the adventures of this movement are the result of a really incredible motivic concentration, a concentration just about as intense and very similar to what went on in the Svelink piece. Everything that happens in this movement relates very directly to one rather absurd five-note motive, which is this. And as this rather short movement runs its course, that movement is, that motive is uh, fragmented and atomized, really, into all sorts of uh, incredible permutations of itself, and it becomes responsible for everything that goes on in the second movement of that sonata. But it's in the first movement that we find the clue to what Beethoven is up to. Because one of the curious things about this piece as a whole is that throughout the length of the sonata, Beethoven doesn't really engage in any very elaborate modulations from one key to another. Each of the movements stays solidly encamped in their particular key, which is respectively E major, E minor, and again E major, and explore only the nearest relatives in the diatonic orbit of those keys. And because the three movements appear to be so disinterested in the sort of restless modulations for which Beethoven was otherwise so famous, those occasions on which the non-diatonic harmonic flavors are injected are very much more striking and surprising than would normally be the case. The most astonishing of these incidents is one which occurs in the first movement and which creates a situation absolutely without precedent, I think, in all of Beethoven's work. It's a bit complicated to explain, but what goes on at this point is that Beethoven represents, in this movement, the area which in a more conventional sonata allegro would be called the secondary thematic group or the subsidiary subject, whatever you like. And he represents it by a pair of episodes in the Daggio tempo, one near the beginning of the movement in the exposition, one near the end in the recapitulation. Here's what the first one sounds like. Now, if this were a conventional first movement in a classical sonata, we would expect that both of these episodes, that one and its companion, one later on, would present more or less the same thematic sequence, respectively in the dominant key for the first one and then in the tonic key for the final one. In effect, the two episodes of which Beethoven works here do manage to achieve a final cadence in the two keys that they're supposed to, but not at all in the way a conventional first movement would do, because in this movement, Beethoven leads us to these cadences in a most extraordinary manner. But the fact is that the harmonic progressions leading up to the attainment of these final cadential positions are in exact inversion, one to the other. Here's, here's the way they sound. what you could call an abstract of the first one, and here's the second one. Now, if you broke that down into harmonic root progressions, it would be this. Now, the harmonic discipline of tonal music, which is to say most of the music of the last three centuries, is approximate rather than exact. It's conciliatory, and it's not unyielding as this is. And a composer like Beethoven would normally be extremely wary of dealing with any harmonic formations of which the mathematical principles have become as intractable as they seem to be here. And Beethoven is, because of this, with one 
astonishingly imaginative gesture, leading us for the first and, in fact, only time in the piece beyond the customary diatonic orbit in which each of the movements functions. Here's the way he does it in what serves as the recapitulation. <laughs> certainly the dramatic heart of that movement. And moreover, he's doing this in such a way that the consequences of this non-diatonic equation are such as to reproduce in miniature scale that particular triangulation of E major to E minor to E major, which also occupied the work as a whole, representing the primary key areas of the three movements. So in this brief tonal incident in the first movement, we catch a glimpse of the future developments of this work, this structure. We're able to predict what's to come later in the piece. Beethoven is creating here a representation on separate time levels of the same series of harmonic events. And we also catch a glimpse of the future in another sense. We find that Beethoven is experimenting with that concept of what one might call multiple tense, the concept of creating simultaneous expanses of one idea at various time levels within a work, which has in fact become the predominant variative characteristic of most of the significant music of our time. In this work, we catch a glimpse of that question which has come to dominate the art of our time, the question of time itself and of the relations of structure to time. And we come to realize that as long as man remains perplexed about that condition of ambiguity in which his own relationship to time is concealed, no other constructive function will so absorb his efforts as will the habit of variation. Here's opus 109. Here's opus 109.
Glenn Gould talked about variations in music. And